Well, hello, hello, everybody. In today's episode, we are interviewing Jason LaRocca. Now, Jason is a producer, engineer, and a scoring mixer, which means he mixes scores for huge name movies and video games all the time. And on top of all that, he's also a punk rocker from a band called The Briggs, which actually did really, really well. So some of Jason's more recent projects when it comes to scoring mixing involve Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Black Mirror, Bad Boys for Life, Bill and Ted Face the Music, and many, many, many others. Oh yeah, and he also worked on Fortnite that tiny game. So on top of just hearing about composition and sound design, which are two most popular fields in the world of film and games, I want to introduce you to more types of people who can show you many, 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 many avenues to making a killer living in the world of music and sound, not just those two. And if you are interested in working in the game industry as a game audio person, whatever avenue that may be, then sign up for my newsletter. That's where I teach you how to make a living and actually get paid really, really well for your work in game audio, whether it be as a composer, sound designer, or something else entirely, I teach you even how to answer the question, so how much do you charge? You also get two free courses that teach you how to network and find projects in the game industry, and you also get free sounds, exclusive ebooks, and exclusive articles that will teach you everything you need to know and more about how to make a living off of your creative career, yes, even if you're just starting out, or even if you're super advanced and you want to increase your income. So sign up for that in the description below or in the card up above, and all of these interviews I'm doing are going to be in a podcast form very soon, so keep an eye on this channel or on my newsletter for that so you can listen to these on the go much much easier really soon so without further ado let's get into the interview with jason so the first question i have for you is that you're actually super fascinating in that you started as a touring musician mm -hmm. then interned with mark isham if i remember correctly yep. and then started becoming interested well while you're touring a musician becoming interested in the whole technical side of things mixing this whole spaceship you're in you wanted to kind of get into that whole realm i'm very curious what kind of started that mindset for you especially long before there were youtube videos telling you how to mix how to record a drum set how to do all of this stuff what was the mindset that made you say you know what this touring thing is good but what if i got more into this technical side well, I, I guess there was a part of me that thought, what if, you know, it doesn't pan out, right? Like, what if touring is like a cool idea, but, but, but may find itself not, you know, fully fulfilling my dreams and goals monetarily, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that's a strange thought to think of as an 18-year-old, because really most 18-year-olds who pick up a guitar are just thinking, you know, this is the fastest way to get free beer, you know what I mean, or whatever. So, but I thought, you know, this, you, you know, a lot of people find themselves at the end of 10 years doing something like that going, I wish I had thought of something else too, right? Yeah. Another option. And, you know, especially now with like a lot of musicians who are now recording from home have to kind of become engineers. And those who weren't technically savvy before, wish that they probably were more you know and when i was doing the band thing and and starting out as a teenager trying to you know do the rock thing i was i recording in a studio was expensive and i just we didn't have the money like we just didn't have a lot of money growing up so it was like how do we make demos you know making demos wasn't easy you didn't have pro tools so it was like you know now you can make a great polished product and most people don't even need to record drums so it's not as big of a you know we had a drum set we had guitars we had bass and it was like oh my gosh we would spend a week making us a, a demo in a studio and spend ten thousand right. dollars you know how are we going to do this so it was like uh, I just thought, well, I could cut some corners. I could get some basic gear, just enough to, you know, I mean, we were literally like duct taping microphones to mic stands because I didn't have mic <laughs> clips. So we would have some of the, some of the microphones would have to like aim straight down because we didn't have the ability to angle them <laughs> into the drums properly. So they were like kind of in the way. And that's just how we made demos. But I, none of us knew how to operate a tape machine or a basic mixer. So literally, I'm not even kidding you. I just, I was just like reading this stuff and, and, you know, skipping math class and stuff like that nice. so that I could learn the insides of a Fostex E16. It was just <laughs> my, my interest was there. 
early on. And I just kind of knew that that was where um, I just knew that I was going to somehow make a career out of it. So I was all in. Right. Nice. And I thought, you know, a band thing is a flash, a, a shot in the dark. You know what I mean? You never know if a band thing's going to make it or not. So I said, I got to have some other career. And so when I started recording our band, other bands that we were playing locally around LA with heard our demos. They're like, these are good. How do you guys do this? I said, well, I'm just doing it myself in my bedroom. Mm. So we started recording other bands. And then um, a buddy of mine who was in another local LA band said, I'm working for this composer and I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to go do some other job and and what do you think about meeting him and seeing if you guys click and maybe you want to intern and maybe assist with him in his at his uh, studio and i thought you know yes but i mean i probably won't qualify i'm not you know i didn't go to full sale i didn't i just have my own setup at home i, I doubt i'm gonna be what this guy wants but i met him and that was mark isham so mm -hmm. at at that juncture i was you know really kind of hoping to become a rock star but mm -hmm. wanted to get really deep into the studio world so that i could kind of consider myself a professional engineer mm. you know i didn't want to be like yeah i'm making it work and i'm i'm all we have so mm -hmm. you know, the band this is all the band has is me and you know i wanted to actually be what like people wanted to work with me i want people to like love what i do so i wanted to become a pro and i thought Maybe there's a way I could do both. I could become a touring musician and somehow also work for a composer. And, you know, I basically just, I did everything I could day and night to try and keep both jobs as long as I could until at one point it just wasn't possible to do both. Yeah. So I worked for him for um, eight, no, uh, six years. And during that time, the band got more and more popular and we made a record. And then that record, the label wanted us to tour on and stuff like that. So once we started touring, I wasn't really able to stay in L.A. constantly enough to be able to hold the job. So I had left uh, the studio job working for Mark. But that's kind of where I really kind of, uh, you know, chomped down the teeth and, and got to know a lot about real engineering and i got put into some really you know do or die situations with like big directors you know mixing a film for brad silberling and it was like i'm 21 years old and i'm mixing in surround and the engineer who was mixing this got sick and i'm in, sitting here mixing for for brad and mark isham's looking over my shoulder and you know this is like really really great stuff that got me kind of like pulled up on my own bootstraps and, and kind of, you know, thrown into the deep end as it were, um, you know, working with like, uh, um, Mike, uh, Simpson from the dust brothers and, uh, you know, just a lot of great people who I got to learn, obviously a lot of really cool things from and, and sort of carry that into touring for a while, but then, then touring thing kind of, that's, that kind of ran its course. And in, in that interim, I kind of, fell back in love with kind of the studio thing, but really wanted to just fully stay in LA. And at that point that was like 2009. And since then I've just been, just been a home guy and uh, you know, holding the fort down and in, in LA. Nice. I love it. It's, it's, it's uh, fascinating to see the, the transition period. And I think for a lot of people on kind of the quote unquote outside, they'll just see someone like you and think, Oh, touring musician, successful, was uh, mixing in surround at 21 no yeah. issue clearly you're just super talented and had no issue doing this it was it must have been so easy for you but no, i know no. it i know it wasn't at all no, not at all no it's it's like it's always you're just sort of stumbling and at least for me you know i'm i'm stumbling in each door and just kind of hoping i can get myself propped up enough that because the thing for me is it's always just been determination to to be immersed in music i didn't want to have a job that was like a desk job of you know selling computers or something like that because i just wasn't it, it's just not my passion my passion is, is music so i've i've just i didn't want to find i knew that there was like the spark when it's there you have to strike fast and it's like you have to the older you get, the harder it is to go in and do jobs 
for basically no money and basically use that as your training and that sort of thing. So it was like when I was 18, I was like, I, I just got to push myself into a studio somehow, even if it's working for free or as an intern or whatever, which is what I did. And just was like, I'm going to sit and read all these manuals from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. and then go home and go get a couple hours of sleep and come back. That was like, I knew I had to take that time when I was really young to do that. Otherwise, it was really going to become harder and harder as I got older. So it wasn't easy and it was not like a glamorous thing of like, here's my diploma and now I'm working for these great people. It was like, you know, please, you know, let me show you that I'm great, you know. And, um, you know, eventually I, I would, I would find myself in good places where, you know, it rolled into new things, you know, but. So is that kind of the mindset that kept you going throughout the initial time where I'm sure it wasn't, oh, I want engineer. Now I'm working at Mark Isham's next week. I'm sure there's a period of time where it was just hell where, you know, you were getting no's or no one was responding. Is that the kind of mindset that you used to carry you through until something came along that was more aligned with what you wanted to do? I got no, I got tons of no's. I, I was, I was like, um, you know, I was, I was trying to get in assistant jobs in all the studios in LA. I would email and call all the different studios and just say, you know, I know about recording. I'm, I didn't go to school doing it, but I, I literally have my own home studio. I designed and built basically in my bedroom. I have a professional tape recorder. I have a Mackie 24, eight console like i know how routing works and i and explaining that to p studios was like you know it was just it, it fell on a dial tone and deaf ears it was just like there was no way you know there was no way without somebody else recommending me or, or getting me you know handed over to a studio owner that anyone was ever going to take a chance with me so it wasn't until i got you know, a friend of mine, you know, where the stars aligned, where a friend of mine happened to be leaving a studio and knew me and knew what I was good at, uh, you know, where I got the recommendation to, you know, to come in and meet him. So, no, I was, there was a lot of closed doors. And I actually thought, you know, if it doesn't happen where I have the opportunity to get into a studio and become a professional engineer, I will just push harder on the touring thing and I'll make it work somehow. But I'm glad that it worked out the way it did because I kind of felt like at, at, at the end of a 10 year touring run at, I was just kind of like kind of burnt on it. Like I just was, it was great, but I needed something else. It was not, it was not all there was for me in life to be fulfilled was to just tour and be in a punk band, which is really, really cool. There was actually a part of that, uh, that lifestyle and that ethos that I carry into what I do now, you know, in, in mixing video games and stuff like that is like, and, and, and even stylistically, but, but on a business side too, of just like, you freaking just, you figure it out, you do it. And if you don't know how to do it, you figure out how to do it. You know what I mean? And if you have enough talent and enough moxie and confidence really that you can figure it out, uh, a lot of that will carry you through the rest of it. You know what I mean? All the fears and anxieties of, oh my gosh, am I going to screw this up? And it's like, yeah, you probably will. But, you know, the, if you if you come out the other end, you know, still alive, there's a chance, you know, you'll, you'll do better the next time, you know? Nice. So <laughs> now, now that you're at the point where, you know, you're getting constant clients, you're doing this full time, that's no issue. Yeah. How are you staying up to date on newer techniques on staying at the edge of your craft? Is it just the work that's kind of keeping you sharp? Is it other things? Are you still practicing in your own way? How do you kind of stay on top of things? You know, every, I feel like every project is always a new challenge because I don't feel like, you know, if maybe if I was working with the same client on two or three projects in a row, I might feel like we've got a little bit of a groove going and I kind of feel like I understand where the other person's coming from, but it's always a different client and it's always a different project. And it's always a different, like really almost like it's the stylistic change. It's the approach of the client is different. And so I kind of have to learn every time. I feel like every time I do a project is always like, haven't I done this before? Like, this is so weird. Like, 
it, it's different enough that it keeps me on my toes. So I, I try and actually keep the technological side of it pretty simple. Um, there are guys who like to like completely change their template, completely change, like add more speakers in their room on this project, you know, do all those kinds of things where they really just throw a bunch of, you know, curveballs at themselves on every project. I'm personally, my, my ethos on it is like, you know, there's a lot of curveballs being thrown at me externally. So I don't need to throw a lot of added internal curveballs at myself because I'm dealing with enough changes. Mm. So my template, my layout, a lot of the plugins I use, a lot of um, how I approach the mix and stuff, I keep pretty consistent from project to project. I mean, once I get happy, I don't change something. And it's still kind of, it's when I'm unhappy with something, I start to kind of explore other options. Like if I'm not really loving my reverbs anymore, I start to kind of go, well, what else is there? And I'll spend two or three projects trying to find a cooler combination of verbs. And I will do that. Um, but right now, I actually feel like there's a great uh, balance right now in technology um, that has made me really satisfied, actually. Like the, the new Mac, which I have, um, the 16 core, mm. I have that in combination with bunch of HDX cards, a bunch of UAD cards. I have three Octo cards and one quad card. And uh, I fill them up on every session. So I use, you know, I, I use uh, UAD card uh, plugins on all my buses usually. So like for live strings, live woodwinds, live brass and live soloists, I put manly massive passives on all of those outputs and they're all quad outputs. So that's four channels for every bus. So um, I, I'm very happy with that sound and that setup. So I haven't really gone, well, what, what's, what it was out there that's better. And, um, and then I just have, you know, my, my, my Avid console and my surround sound speakers, which I'm really happy with. And, and I don't use a lot of outboard gear. I use pretty much, all in the box stuff because i feel like this kind of goes back to talking about the time issue of like how do we really control um our own sanity amongst sort of a a a you know you look at your calendar and you think you're not doing anything but throughout the day you've answered five different phone calls you've been pulled on to three different projects that you weren't expecting to be pulled on to to do a reprint or to fix something make a change and if there's outboard gear going on during all this crazy curveballs that I didn't have set right when I'm coming back to recall a mix, I mean, there's just another can of worms that I don't feel like opening up. So I stay very internal when I can on projects uh, so that I can go back and forth very quickly. And some, but sometimes when I send someone a mix, I don't hear back for five days in that five day period, I've done another project or five other mixes. So I'm sure you know this and, and you probably think the same way, or maybe you don't, I'm actually curious because for me, that's just been the, the way to stay on top of it and to, to really stay consistent and give the never screw up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's in, like on my end too, it's definitely like having systems in place is so crucial to being able to sit down. There's no resistance to starting the work and doing the work yeah. so that when you have to get it out there again, sometimes the deadline is very, very short. So you have to just get it out there. And if you have that all set up, you press a button and it's all there, then you're good. Like it's much, much easier to, to get things done. And speaking of that, getting things done thing and all those curveballs that you're going to have to deal with, every day in this industry within and without how do you kind of structure your days are they random are they different every time how are you kind of managing your time how do you balance projects how do you balance what gets priority is it time is it budget is it anything else and how do you do all of that while having a family <laughs> right well uh the cool thing with that is that uh different clients like to work different ways and and i've found that that I try and use that to my advantage. So what I mean by that is like um, uh, there's some studios that, that don't really have 
a hard schedule on on a project and i'm working on one right now that's three and a half hours of game music and it's going to take us through probably july mm -hmm. and um you know they they come in ask for me to do things and then i don't hear from them for a while so there's there's a project like that where it's it's a little bit more you know the time's a little more ubiquitous it's not like really set and here it is and around that i have you know like a like a film project and ten, those tend to be really hard deadlines and the film projects are like you know because you're not the end of the of the line right so at least not for me my music mix has to be delivered to another mixer who mixes that with the dialogue so i have to hit right on target with another mixer's schedule so for the film stuff that's really tricky and when it's happening, it's like you're mixing reel one Monday, you're mixing reel two Tuesday, and it's really laid out like that. And once it happens, it's really structured. But the problem with those projects is we don't always know when they actually are going to start. We say we're starting the 12th of January. Well, I'll get a call the 10th of January saying actually we're moving now to the 18th. So if I booked something on the back end of that, thinking I'm going to make my January look like this nice linear thing, it won't work. And it never does. So I'm prepared in the studio to be able to overlap things. And so I have this whole setup in here, which is a, a, a big elaborate surround sound mix setup. And I have a duplicate of it in my other room. Cool. So, it's a complete mirror image of this setup. So if I need to print something that I'm mixing here so that I can mix the next thing in here and have it get printed, I can send it off to the other room and have it get printed. So that, so that if the schedules do that crazy thing like that and end up on top of each other, I don't stop. Because the only other way to do that was to work 24 hours a day. And I would have my assistant come in at midnight and work from midnight to 7 a.m. And then I'd come back in at 7 a.m. and work until 11 p.m. And that was really difficult on everybody's um, sharpness. Yeah. We would, you know, you can make mistakes like that, you know, when you're just kind of basically on, on, on fumes. So this way has made it so that we can all work normal hours, still go home at night, see the fam, um, but be able to do two things at once, basically. And um, I mean, I just haven't been able to figure out another way to do it. It's, you know, it's, it's not the cheapest option. It costs a lot of money. <laughs> uh, but it's... Um, unless somebody's saying we're booking you from January 1st to January 14th. And if we change the dates on you, we get penalized $5,000. There's no other way to really make money doing this other than to just be able to take anybody's constant changes and be able to roll with any one of them. Mm -hmm. So I have to think to myself, what's the What change in this scenario could occur? This could move back a week which is going to now start with my next project if it moves back a week. Well, what can I do? Well, I could be printing one of them while I'm mixing the other one. Oh, cool. So that just means I have to have a second rig. So that's what I did. And that's proven to work. So, um, you know, that's, I don't know any other way unless, unless things start to go back to the old school way of like people knew that when you were in the studio, it was sacred time. Because no one thinks of it as sacred time anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when you book an orchestral session, that is, you know, because you've got 30 musicians who are showing up at 1 p.m. If you if you cancel the session, you're you're fined the entire fee of the session. No one wants to do that. Mm -hmm. But with mixing, we don't get away with that anymore. We can't say to the client, well, we're going to charge you the day's rate because you canceled and moved us a week. You basically aren't going to get called again. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's another thing that I actually wasn't taught really early on is sort of like the cutthroat of it is like, you know, if you are able to kind of go and roll with it 
for a client and do what they need schedule wise and all that, you'll always get called. The thing is, is you can't burden them. You can't burden your clients. So if you want to have three or four or five or six clients and, and stay really, really busy, you have to be able to roll with that mm-hmm. and be like totally cool as a cucumber the whole time. Yeah. So while you're kind <laughs> of work, you're, yeah, it's so true. It's very, very true. There's a constant sine wave from everyone in the entertainment industry constantly. Yeah. Yeah. When you're when you're in audio, you kind of get pushed into this place where you have to be the boat on top of all the waves, <laughs> having to deal with all the changes. Yes. So how do you kind of stay focused and energized while you're doing that? Because you're in a windowless room all the time, just hanging out. How are you staying focused, distraction free? You're not kind of wandering over to the dopamine things like Instagram and Facebook and things like that. Yeah. What keeps yeah. you kind of absolutely laser on your task? Um, I think one of them is that uh, I get inspired by the idea that I could put something out that people will really go, wow, this sounds incredible. Mm. And that's, that's actually a big part of my drive. So when I'm working on something and I'm, and I'm mixing it, or if my task is to record it, or if it's to produce it, whatever it is, my laser viewpoint is just on how can I, uh, not only wow my client, but wow, whoever's going to hear this thing and just go, if, if your job is to make it sound really good, how can you make this sound better than anyone else has made it sound? I mean, if really you're ultimately, ultimately you're actually just trying to make an emotional impact, right? So it's like, however you get the, the, the means to that end is, is, is really infinite. So if you can, if you can really make a seriously killer emotional impact that's because I always feel like I'm not quite doing that. Like every time I listen to a project I mixed a month ago or, or produced or whatever, I go, that's good, but I think I could have done it better. Mm. Like anytime I ever hear something I did a while ago, I go, wow, I would do that differently now. So I'm always just trying to like mix it so well that it'll just be sort of timeless, you know, and that timeless sort of thing is, is hard to achieve. You know, it's like to really get it super, super good to a point where I'm happy with it. And when I listen to it a year from now, I feel like it's fresh. That's really hard to achieve. So I'm, I'm trying to compete with myself because I feel like that in a way is like the best, best way you could kind of keep yourself energized is like, there's a lot of external noise. There's a lot of other people doing things. A lot of people talking about how these plugins are great or whatever. And you think, Oh gosh, this guy has an advantage or this guy is, you know, going to make it sound better. And it's, and it's not, it's not really that at all. It's kind of like, how can you make this impact yourself? Like I've cried sometimes mixing certain things. And that's when I've known that, that, that it was really good. And that is all that matters, whether or not somebody else has more gear than you or has a cooler studio or has a Grammy or not, doesn't matter. You know, if you made yourself cry doing something, (laughs) then you could have done it with, you know, all of the basic avid stock plugins. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. I mean, look at Phineas and Billie Eilish, right? It's all stock logic and they're killing it. Perfect example. It's like, you know, Phineas is like telling you, he's laughing when he's telling these people how he produced this stuff because he's not using anything different. He's just so fucking genius with how he does it. Right. Yeah. The guy's mind is his tool. Right. Yeah. And it is a secret weapon. Yeah. And I think that's true of like all of us, right? That's what we, we have, have to, to kind of yeah. rely on with all the tech we have, all this access we have. That's yeah. kind of the determining factor at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think like with certain things, when you have kids, for me, when now that I have kids, making uh, things that they can enjoy is actually really, nice. really cool because... Um, you know, there's like things that I think are great that I've either worked on or just like to listen to. And my son, Brixton, who's seven, will think it's crap, you know? <laughs> and I feel like 
I feel a little bit like uh, not cool, right? I feel like kind of like I'm I'm like an old man or something. So when I have a t- an, an instant where I can click with him and feel like he agrees that something is great, and like for instance, like Fortnite, like he sure. thinks it's really cool, and he's like, "You worked on that, Dad. That's so cool." And I'm like, I didn't at the time even really know what it was, and um. You know, and he was he was too young to even be playing video games. So I, it wasn't as significant as it is to me now because I have that relationship with him. And I feel like, uh, you know, if I can get on that that level where I can actually impress my kids, that's another sort of level of like a trying to achieve, like what am I trying to go for? The, the drive factor is like if I can – if I can actually do something that my kids think is cool, then uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, that's a good marker. And I'm sure that mindset of like wanting to outdo yourself and do things that your kids, kids think is great is like help helpful for one, staying on top of things, staying energized, and also probably helps bring in new clients constantly, right? I'm sure they know, yeah. oh, Jason sounds great. He's always pushing the edge. He's always sounding great. Every project we've worked with him, it always sounds awesome. And we didn't want to keep coming back to him. Is there any, at this point in your career, do you need to bang the drum for finding new clients? Do you need to kind of yeah. do that sort of networking? How do you kind I of do. do that at your stage? I do. I, um, You know, it's really odd too, because I feel like even after I do a big project and suddenly there's there's like this like uh, really uh, disturbing quiet in the room, <laughs> I go, God, like, Damn, I don't know if you're, are you are you allowed to swear on your podcast? Yeah, totally. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I just think you know, I just think, fuck, man, like I gotta get on the phone because, like, no, like, what am I doing this month? And I will go out as if I'm not expecting a single call. I, I get very determinedly, like, you know, and even sometimes it's it's not actually so like you know militant, but like you know, go when, when, when we were going out to dinner and doing things and being social, I would, I would go out to dinner with, you know, clients and just hang out, you know, not talking about work or anything, right. just, you know, just to hang out. And, uh, and I think that cycle proves to be really kind of uh, therapeutic because I feel like if I'm, you know, if I'm done with a project, I probably should go out anyway and socialize a bit. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, I, I do that. I'll, I'll, I'll do, and most of my clients are friends anyway. So, you know, we'll go out and, and hang out and stuff and have dinner or, or do drinks or whatever, do a zoom call now or whatever. And I just, uh, you know, sometimes it gets, I do even just send projects I'm doing. Like I'll go, Hey, uh, this is, this is something I just did on a project that I'm really proud of, you know, and I'll just send them something and have them listen to it. And, um, a lot of my clients like that too. Like they, they, they like to hear from me. They like to hear from, you know, hear what I'm doing and stuff like that. So uh, regardless of what I've done in the past, yes, I still do that. And I still um, staying in touch the same way I did when I was, you know, had zero work and zero money and was trying to figure it all out. Same way I did that is the same, you know, maybe not as long of a period of right, doing right. it, but, I definitely, whenever I have downtime, I'll, I'll be thinking, all right, let's, uh, let's reach out. <laughs> I think you've going. summarized like all yeah. of, all of finding work in our industry is be a person. Yes. And it's so true. Like it's yeah. very easy to ignore that because it's easy to stay in your cave and say, no, I have to wait till I get really good. I have to make this yeah. perfect thing before I talk to a single person, but they're not going to hire you. if They don't know you exist. Well, I've, yeah, I mean, I've gotten, t- um, you know, moments of feeling sort of cocky where i'm like oh i shouldn't have to call anybody right right and like um i just feel like that's never really uh i've been i've been uh i've found that i've been kind of upset with myself afterwards in in seeing my attitude that way not really pan out Mm -hmm. you know of like going oh yeah i've done because the thing is like i can talk to almost anybody and they're not going to know they might know one project i've done or or something you know maybe but like there's always something you don't know about somebody you're working with 
or, or talking to or whatever. And it's, and, and actually one of the biggest things for me is like anybody I meet, I'm going to just assume that they're, you know, some owner of some massive website and have millions of dollars in the bank and be like the, the, the one person I wish I was nicer to or something like that. I don't want to ever feel like, uh, I was, I was not mean to someone because I didn't think they were important. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that took me a while to learn because I wasn't always that way. I Mm -hmm. would, I would treat certain, sometimes I I went through phases of being cocky about certain things and I'd walk into a studio and I'd be like, I did this project. So, you know, you should know that. And, and if you're an assistant or you're blah, I'm not really saying hi to you and stuff. And man, that, that attitude, especially at this day and age is like, nobody respects that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of, pressure now on quality for everybody and that sort of thing and so anybody who walks in with an attitude like that is really gonna find themselves doing their last gig Mm -hmm. you know yeah so um i try and just you know not only reach out to uh you know people who i know are successful and that sort of thing but just be be cool and helpful with those who are trying to come up as composers, as the sound designers, as engineers. You know, I get emails every day from guys on Instagram and Facebook and, and even my business email saying, you know, how did you make it in the business? What would you recommend for a microphone? Blah, blah, blah. I answer all of them. I answer every email. And so I think that stuff is really important because you never know and probably so those guys will become your next boss mm-hmm. you know they they they're all the next generation of of important people you know mm-hmm. so it's all got to be you know all inclusive you know what i mean uh as far as like how do you keep work and this is a maybe a broader answer to your question but it really does come down to like respecting people you know and i think if you're that type of person and you said as you said be a person uh, a lot of that work does just kind of fall in more easily, you know, if you are just being a person. Totally. And you you said it really well. I'm glad that people are reaching out to you, asking you questions, you're answering them. And I'm sure you get asked all the time, people saying like, oh, can I assist you? Can I be your intern? Those sorts of questions. Or like, yeah. how can I get work with you? Something like that, something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. And for those people who are up and coming right now, our future bosses, basically, yeah. what what sorts of things should they be saying doing carrying themselves like when they are approaching someone like you what is something that you really like to see in your inbox what makes you like oh wow this person's got their stuff together yeah i like to see guys who are making me aware of technology and ideas and things that i'm not aware of because Mm. that's i think what's really really great about the young generation is they're going to know certain things that i don't because i'm sitting here and i'm working they're sitting there and they should be researching so they should have research resources that I don't. So when a guy comes to me and says, oh, you know, I really love your work, blah, blah, blah. Hey, have you checked out uh, blah, 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 key command set or blah or whatever, something that I'm not aware of, or hey, did you check out this free plugin from this new company, blah, 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 you should check it out. You know, those kinds of things I find really cool because it makes me understand. I, I know that their head's really in it and it's in the right place. It's in the sort of where is this all going, the future, you know, being a, a resource for things. And so that's what I really, I, my, my ear perks to that stuff. I go, you know, that's a kid I want to have around my studio. Nice, yeah. nice. So. Yeah, providing value to you basically seeing like exactly yeah i thought of you on this yeah right it's a it's a really i I used to like when i when i was first interning for mark uh aisham i was one of the tasks i had actually was to go and buy a bunch of cds from uh tower records and just listen to them and and pick stuff that was really interesting and cool and uh it was like a really i was like wow this is a really cool thing to be given to do so i went out and i bought like you know i don't know 50 records from tower records and i'd listen to them all and there were certain things that i thought were really cool and i'd show them to at the time who was uh his assistant and before it would get to mark i'd say i think this was really cool 
and he'd listen to it and be like, there's no way he's going to want to listen to that. And, and I got really sort of sharp on my skills of like how to be useful in researching things, because that's a lot of time out of somebody's day who, if they're really busy and very important, you can be a serious value to, mm-hmm. you know, and especially with the internet now and all the time we have now sitting at home doing the, you know, everybody wishing they had a job. It's like, be resourceful to other people, you know, yeah. and uh, you have, you have literally the world at your fingertips to do that with. I had to go, you know, <laughs> I mean, people still go buy records, I guess, but you know, that is a thing of the past, but we had to go buy records and put them on the listening station. You remember the barcode, you'd scan it and you could listen to it on the headphone. Listen. Oh yeah, I do. When yeah. I was a wee lad. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it was the only way you could listen to music. It's like, we didn't even have phones that had music on them. So it was like, we go to tower records, we'd have to scan the CD in the listening station, put the headphones on only one headphone would work. And yeah. it was like, you know, so you could get anything you want within five seconds. You could, you can know about these things. So it's like, you don't have any excuses for being a resource of knowledge. And I think that's uh, really, really a, a good first step, honestly, in, in yeah. getting in as an intern. I think that's some of the best advice I've ever heard on that. That's <laughs> very, very smart and very well put. Yeah. So one last question before we wrap up. When you were starting out in this industry, maybe just when you're starting out as a musician, you were just a touring musician, and to now, how did you define success? So how did you define success when you're starting, when you're in the rock star phase maybe, and how do you define it now and how much has that changed? Yeah, I mean, we had like, you know, moments of, of you know, I, I, that's a good question because I think anything where I, I considered success in in a few different ways. Like what there was there was a time when our band had a song that uh, got recognized by the LA Kings franchise. And that song got used as their theme song. And several years after that happened, they won two Stanley Cups. And and the song cool. song ended up becoming the most requested song on K Rock for two weeks. And our band got asked to be on Kevin and Bean. Whoa. And Kevin and Bean doesn't even exist anymore, which is sad because I grew up listening to it and was like a huge fan of the show. So that was a big moment of success for me because I thought, here's something that you did and didn't expect much of. And it resonated with so many people. Like probably like Super Mario Brothers when that got made. I don't know. Yeah, that they knew it was going to sell 40 million copies or whatever. It went on to sell probably more. And that it would just permeate, right? And yeah. really kind of be like almost like the, the, the jumping point for what video games have become now. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. like just really cu- cultural phenomenon. And, uh, you know, we didn't have that. We weren't, you know, we didn't sell millions of records, but that was like really cool. It was really yeah. interesting that we thought back to like when we wrote that song in our bedroom going, this is just a song, right? But now we're, we're playing it at Staples Center in front of 20,000 people before a Kings game. And that's kind of crazy. Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't the same as, you know, uh, selling millions of records and 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 the kinds of success that you know taylor swift and any pop artist that you name is a household name that people would know but that was a that was a success to me that i was proud of and then really a- anything i think that you that you sort of set out to do and you sort of somehow exceed the expectation that to me is a success mm. um and that's why I also think like uh, part of the success is, is just doing the adventure because you'd think sometimes, wow, what if I had done that gig? What if I had said yes to that? That would have actually been really fun. So I try and do everything because to me, this, the success is in, is in the unknown of it. Mm. You know, It's like, I didn't know what Fortnite was or what it would become. I didn't, I didn't even know what it was. I did. I was like, 
you know, this was this was like a game that became three months after I was involved in it. It was already a game, of course, beforehand, but it, it just exploded. And I think it's it's really just kind of like you don't know where the success is going to be. So really just kind of uh, setting the goal that you're going to do something great and having it come out greater than your expectation that is the success and whether that comes back as money or not doesn't matter it's just that uh you made way more people happy with what you did than you would expect it or you had maybe made more money with something than you would expect it it's just the kind of that it's always that fortune cookie of like you just don't know what it's going to be so uh, it's a it's a hard one to answer but i guess for me it's just it's just kind of like uh, uh, the success for me is just kind of in the unknown of just taking everything I possibly can and just enjoying it and like letting it be what it's going to be, mm. you know, because I think it's like you could find success in just like the fact that you finished a song that that's that is a great success. Some people just sit and sit on songs forever and never finish them. Yeah. You know, so. uh you know, I think the fact that uh, the fact that I'm still alive right now, that's a pretty big success. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many thousands of miles of road we traveled on in a van in dark, icy roads <laughs> and never fell off a cliff. I mean, that's that, that's a raging success. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so this was awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. This was yeah. hugely helpful. I'm sure tons of people are going to yeah. love this and get a ton of good advice out of this. So is there anywhere that people can reach out to you or find you social media, website, all that sort yeah. of stuff? Yeah, um, my my social, I think is just my name. Instagram is uh, Jason uh, LaRocca. And uh, my website is jasonlaRocca.com. And I think my Facebook is like, Jason the Rock and Nine. I don't okay. know why. Well, I'm sure people could find you pretty quickly. It's, you know, honestly, if you Google my name, it, it just shows up. I'm Perfect. actually looking to see if, yeah, it's just Jason LaRocca. That's, oh, Jason underscore LaRocca. Okay, my, cool. <laughs> Easy so to anyway, find. Anyway, if you Google my name, the website shows up and that takes you everywhere you need to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is Thank awesome. You yeah, man. Talk soon. <laughs>